I check uh, these entries against the NASA webpage, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong in what I'm going to say. So, uh, Robert is actually Robert Allen Cross. He was born in, he's a New Yorker, um, and has had a very busy life. So much so that that uh, he got his undergraduate and graduate degrees in theoretical physics in Colombia. In, and if I'm right, uh, you got your PhD by the age of 24. Um, yeah. Then he moved 23, to actually. Hudson yeah. Laboratories um, with, at Columbia University, first as a, a research scientist and then later as director of research. Um, at that time, um, uh, you, were, uh, uh, under, uh, you were the technical manager, product manager of a project called Artemis, which was developing a large uh, sonar system for the active sonar system for the Navy. In CC3, then, um, Robert moved to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, to what became the DARPA uh, program at the U U.S. Department of Defense. Um, and the, here the information says that you were working as director for nuclear and theft detection. Uh, after that, then, um, in '66, he became assistant secretary of the Navy uh, and in charge of all the um, uh, research and development at the, at the U.S. Navy. And in 1966, uh, sorry, 1973 to 1975, he was assistant executive director of the United Nations uh, Environmental Program. In 1977, he moved to NASA to become its fifth administrator, staying there until 1981, when the Carter administration uh, was finished, and then he moved to General Motors, becoming the vice president of research and, and developing GM uh, Research Labs. In 1993, he decided to retire, finally. <laughs> no, so he can't hold the job. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's what my mother-in-law used to say. <laughs> you, 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 forgot, you forgot his stint here at Woods Hole. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, that. That I couldn't find. So anyway, so he went to the Kennedy School of Government, and well, he's active in policy and research. Okay. Robert? Uh, as you can see, this is a retread of a talk. And uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, Jim Lynch and I were talking about some, a talk he was going to give. And I said, oh, I have some slides on that. And I sent him the slides. And as a result, I'm giving this talk. Uh, it's, uh, it's partly history and partly institutional arrangements for doing applied research. Uh, it's fairly deep history. Uh, and it begins in a, in a, this, the slide sequence begins in an odd way. I need to explain what this, these talks were constructed for. Uh, I was working with a group at the Kennedy School that was interested in the use of science and engineering for international development, develop in, de in developing countries. And it started with the, with the question of how come we know so much and so little of it seems to do any good? So the theme was, you know, what is it that one can say about the use of knowledge to do something for some job that somebody wants done? And I kept sitting there saying, well, you know, some of us think we kind of know how to go about doing that. And so I was finally challenged uh, to put together a couple of talks on it. And this is really two of those compressed together. And the third one was given by Dick Pittenger, uh, who filled in a whole lot of other stuff. So let me start with this. And oh, that's okay, nice. It oh, it did. It did do it while I turned my back. Now, this was a group of people who are mostly not scientists or engineers, although some of them are. Uh, 
Most of them are political scientists and social scientists. And what they wanted to start with was the, the political science and social science theory of how military R&D gets done. So I'm going to run through several things. A guy named Owen Cote uh, wrote a whole book on the political science of, of military R&D. And from his theoretical point of view that the reason why things change is because the civilian executives at the top of the Navy say intervene and there are internal struggles for power and inter-service rivalry and intra-service competition and please note this theory contains nothing in it about anybody actually wanting to do anything. <laughs> it only has to do with with people arguing but all of it all of it is part of the part of the process. And then the second part was that people don't like to change systems so they're resistant to R&D and here's a whole list of reasons for for conservatism uh, you, you already own a lot of ships and airplanes, you don't want to spend more money. Uh, you've also, everybody already has a career and they don't want to change. Uh, nobody quite trusts new stuff because you don't know how to test it in a, in a real way. And then of course you have large coordinated systems and the instant you breathe on them with something new, it, they're likely to come unglued. And Please remember, most of the period of time I'm going to be talking about is back in the deep past, post-World War II, up through maybe 15, 20 years ago, when there were no computer capabilities to simplify coordination. So everything was done by very tedious means. So the conclusion from this particular set of theories is that R&D is presumably a byproduct of all kinds of political battles, internal ones and external ones. Uh, then there was the, the McNamara theory, planning, programming, and budgeting system, where you'd start with what are the foreign policy objectives of the United States and what is the national strategy, and eventually you'd work your way down to the fact that you needed a new fuse for a, for a torpedo. Uh, so, in that case, R&D is presumably a, require, a result of military requirements. Somebody in the military says, gee guys, we need a new fuse for the, for the torpedo. Uh, uh, however, they didn't leave out this part. It was in the budget. Uh, but it made some of them very, very uncomfortable that there were people who, who were doing things for which there wasn't a military requirement yet. And that got to be a paradoxical problem. Uh, but of course, it's not unreasonable, but you couldn't do it. By the time you did this year's analysis of foreign policy and so on and so on and so on, the budget process was finished. It was over, it was gone, you never got out of it. So instead of being PPBS, it became please pass the bullshit. I mean, it was just, you sort of, sort of were, were sort of uh, rationalizing what it was that you really decided on. It never worked. And of course, it produced this model. You, should, you shouldn't do serious R&D unless there's a military requirement. But how do you get a military requirement for something that somebody hasn't already thought about? So you kept going round and round. And in practice, what actually happened was very straightforward. 6-1 and 6-2 didn't require a military requirement. That was agreed. And in the Navy, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, I owned that budget. It was my signature. Uh, not the military sides, curiously enough. I think it's still that way by law. The Air Force and the Army are different. But you couldn't get to 6.3 or 6.5, that is, you couldn't start to build a real thing that would go test in the field without a military. Re what you mostly did was you ignored it. And if somebody said, where's the military requirement, you'd go find a, a convenient admiral who would invent one with you. Uh, and I'll come back to that kind of idea of the process. Then, of course, there's the, the ever-present uh, military industrial complex thing, the reason things change is somebody wants to pedal something, so the Lockheed guy comes in and pedals it, and, uh, and that's what you get. And the question is, you know, it's partly true, 
but you know the assumption is that uh, the arms merchant can always convince the naval officer uh, and you know is that good or bad so we just just a thought Okay, now this is sort of my theory of what really happens as you get down at the bottom, you know. Many naval officers think, many scientists think. Sometimes they think together, you know, able to have a conversation. And all naval officers know, all scientists know. By the way, the arms merchants also think. They have, they have ideas, and that might be a good thing as well. When I say, you know, which naval officers and which scientists, at GM I was perpetually being told, all of your scientists and engineers ought to go over and spend time in the manufacturing divisions. To which the answer was, look, I've got some people who are really valuable, and I wouldn't dream of subjecting a, a manufacturing division to some of them, or them to some of the manufacturing divisions. Those of you who knew, who knew him might think a moment about what it would have been like to send Al Vine off to fix a problem in a manufacturing place. <laughs> Brilliant guy, national asset, but don't send him to fix a production line. Now, some additional theory. One, the customer for R&D is always wrong. What do I mean? How is a customer for R&D possibly going to know what it is possible to get out of R&D unless the customer is actually an R&D person? Customers are usually thinking about what they need now, what they need next year, almost never thinking about what they may need in five years or ten years. They're just not good at it. Uh, so that's a problem. And then there's a second thing they usually ask the wrong question. And I'll come back to, to an example of that. Then, of course, you have to think about system engineering. You have to think about where this fuse is going to be in this torpedo, in this torpedo tube, in this submarine, and what's it going to be doing, and so on. If you, otherwise, you, you build junk. I'll come back to matrices of knowledge, and of course, Bureaucracy is the ever-present enemy. That is, it's trying to explain to you, you shouldn't do this because it wasn't in last year's published plan, or it wasn't in the budget, and so on. So you found loopholes, and you go around saying, gee, I didn't know there was such a rule, or gee, send me the form, or you know, whatever. Uh, it's harder to do nowadays, it's much harder. OK. now. What's the customer really want? Well, I'll give an example. Admiral comes and says, Bob, you guys have got to give us faster fighter aircraft. OK, why do you need faster fighter aircraft? Oh, so when we get in a dogfight, we can maneuver faster than the other guy. Yeah, but the first thing that happens in a dogfight is you turn. And when you turn, you go to velocity zero. Oh, well, no, it's really so we can get to the dogfight faster and be prepared when the other guy is there. Uh, oh, why do you want to get to the dogfight faster? Well, so we can kill the other guy. You know, we have a better chance of killing him. Oh, so what you really want is to get the weapon to the dogfight faster. So the end of the discussion is, no, you don't really need a faster fighter aircraft. What you need is a longer range fast weapon. So that kind of thing. How do they know what the possibilities are? Same, same another example. Uh, nobody ever asked for, I don't know if it's a good idea, but nobody in the military ever asked for a beam weapon. You know, hadn't occurred to them there could be such a thing as a laser weapon. Uh, then the other thing is, of course, we all have a tendency to say that thing, wonderful thing I did in the lab last week is just what you need. So there's a flip side. And by the way, the other problem is not only are they likely to tell us what they want us to build for them, but they'll tell us how to do it. And in fact, usually their idea of what they want is their answer to what they think the problem is. That is, build me a, an aircraft with the following kind of engine. 
And then, of course, there are a whole set of questions about time relationships. R&D takes a long time. If you want something in two years, you better not start the 6-1 research today. You ain't going to get it in two years. And so there are a whole set of interrelationship problems that you have to think about. Now, this I'm not going to spend much time on it. You guys are basically system engineers. You're used to going back and saying, so what is the purpose of this thing really? Where does it fit? How does it fit in the system? So I don't think I need to spend much time. But for the audience at the Kennedy School, this was a blinding flash of something new. It hadn't. <laughs> it literally had not occurred to many of them that it doesn't do any good to ship grain to a starving country in Africa unless you actually have a pier for the ship and trucks and roads. That, you know, ship the grain, they'll eat. Uh, that's, that's an exaggeration, but not too much of a caricature. There are lots of people who, Jeff Sachs is a perfect example, send money and somehow they'll eat. Well, it doesn't work that way. Okay, now, I mentioned knowledge matrices, and this is something you also understand, but lots of non-technical people don't understand. If you say, I want a more efficient lower emissions auto engine, there's a lot of science in that and a lot of engineering in that. And you can't just say, well, I'm going to have a, I'm going to put a better molecule in there to burn. Because as soon as you change the combustion chemistry, you change the combustion, you have to change the ignition. It flows differently. The gases flow differently. The heat transfer has a different set of of rates, the mechanical systems are pulsed in a different way, the structure has different pressures, you, you may need different materials. Uh, there was an interesting problem with substituting the older chlorofluorocarbons in air conditioners and automobiles with 134A, because it turned out 134A was not compatible with the greases that were used in the compressors with the older chlorofluorocarbons. And if you put the grease that was compatible with 134 in as a drop win, it ate away all the seals. So you had to start all over again with that, so on. And then, so that's the first level <coughs> matrix, but then in the next level, there's another matrix that breaks up all of these and so on. It's a process you guys all know about, but it's not so widely understood. And then, of course, the individual theories. You know, in the real world, you've got a whole lot of things going on, so you've got to worry about the politics as well as, as, well as the rest of it. Okay, and this was then turned into a second, uh, a second uh, lecture, which I will now proceed to, if I can make this machine operate. Didn't go away. It's supposed to go away. There we go. Oh, went too far away. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Okay. Here we go. Slideshow. Uh, Another slideshow. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to the history and how this some of this played out in practice in the days long gone by. Submarine warfare in World War II. The Navy came out of World War II with the clear perception that it had survived the submarine war by the skin of its teeth and a great deal of luck. And they were really scared that if they had to play a more modern submarine war with the Soviets, they'd be in deep trouble. Now, why did they survive? Well, the sonar was, on the whole, Probably U.S. sonar and British ASDEC were better than the German sonars, but it's not really very clear. Uh, we had periscope detecting radar before anybody else did. And of course, that led to a whole game of measures and countermeasures and so on. But Admiral Donetsk in the Atlantic made a terrible mistake. He wanted to be in command of all his submarines. That meant he had to know where everybody was and what they were doing. So every single day, every submarine in the German fleet had to come up to periscope depth at least once, 
and send a high frequency radio message to Berlin. And we had high frequency direction finding systems. So roughly speaking, every day we knew where all the Germans were. <laughs> now, not, not well enough to do the job, but well enough so that it was a major advantage. And he didn't catch on until too late. So if the next group of guys caught on and didn't play that silly game, then it might be a very close shave. So they were very, very frightened. And so it was, this, this was the set of worries. They won the submarine war, but it was close. The German submarines had new developments. They had snorkels. We didn't have snorkels. This meant the submarine could have very long, effective battery life without actually surfacing. Nobody knew what nuclear submarines would mean. Nobody knew what the Soviets were going to do. What about quiet submarines? Maybe somebody will figure out how to do this and how are we going to deal with this. So that's about when I, then, then of course this story I think most of you, especially the acoustics guys know, the afternoon effect and the BT from here, Ewing and Warzel, very low long stuff and really long range, low frequency stuff. And of course the, the key thing was that the wartime research happened with cooperation. That is, the military and the civilian research people were all in each other's pockets. Nobody worried about bureaucracy. Nobody worried about whether bills were paid and so on. I once asked somebody, a senior guy in O&R who'd been there through the war, what did everybody do about contracts? You know, everybody is now dominated by contracts. He said, as far as I can tell, they were all signed the day after VE Day. <laughs> they just called, people were called. There's a story about General Motors going into the airplane business. Uh, whoever was counting airplanes decided we weren't building B-17s fast enough during World War II. So the appropriate guy called up the president of General Motors and said, you guys are going to build B-17s. And the president of General Motors said, we don't know anything about airplanes. You know, we can build cars, we can't build airplanes. And the answer was, you're going to build, build airplanes. I want B-17s to roll out of your factory in less than a year. And in fact, they actually went out and bought Willow Run Airport built a factory, and in six months they were producing flyable b 7 I don't know what the first ones were like, but, but it worked. You know, it was a sort of, don't bother me with the details, just go and do it. And if you're worried about whether take path A or take path B, send somebody on both paths and we'll sort it out later. <clears throat> now, this is, this is, I don't know if you've seen this, but in 43, Doc Ewing's idea of what to use long-range long range transmission for was as a system of communication, not as a detection system, not as anything else, but somehow or other the original idea of, of, uh, of deep sound, sound transmission was that a downed aircraft could, could drop a small charge in the ocean and it could be located so that they could be found or that you'd know there was somebody there. Uh, all of this you know. I came in at sort of the beginning of this about 55 years ago. I came into the, into the business. Bill Nirenberg recruited me, believe it or not. Uh, so this is what we sort of knew. We knew about convergence zones, and we had uh, so far, namely locating things with explosives and, and the reverse you set off explosives at fixed places and somebody who hears them knows where they are. Uh, and then Ted Hunt, who was a uh, professor of applied physics at Harvard, uh, sold the Navy on the concept of, we can, in principle, detect everything that's in the ocean in an hour. An hour is about the transmission time across the Atlantic and back. So his motto was an ocean an hour. And then there were all the, all the problems you know about. So uh, they started to build the, they started to build a response to the worries. And the Navy invented ONR. And 
when the Navy invented ONR, what it did was inventing NSF and ONR. NSF is a kind of a later copy of the ONR idea. They started SOSIS, Sound Surveillance System, which is a system of big arrays that you know about that were all over the coasts of the Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, it was called Project Jezebel. It was run by Western Electric and AT&T. And, but they didn't, the Navy wanted somebody else to worry about this acoustic stuff. So they, in addition to having Woods Hole worry about it, and Scripps worry about it, and NRL and so on, they invented Hudson Labs, specifically to look at long range, low frequency underwater detection. This is just a side item. Everybody knows about a sonoboy, but sonoboys were always passive listening devices. And so somebody thought up the idea of using a separate sound source, an explosion, and using the sonoboys as a set of detectors to get an echo off a submarine. It was called Project Julie because there was a, a very well-known and rather voluptuous uh, cafe singer in New York at the time. Julie, I don't remember her last name, and so they called it Project Julie because it made passive buoys active. Uh, and uh, then there was, there was a, an Admiral Hartwell who did a report and that created Project Michael which was after Michael Pupin, a physics professor of a previous era at Columbia who do the oceanography. And so we were chartered to be the scientific sort of counterweight to AT&T and Bell Labs. That is, we were just supposed to do science, but the Navy was going to look to us and say, hey, are these guys doing the, their part of the science right? And in fact, the first serious job I had in the business was to, was to do ray tracing in order to figure out whether the SOSIS arrays should be deeper or shallower than the depth at which they were being put, which was largely picked out of a hat because it looked like it would be all right and it was convenient from an engineering point of view. We ended up saying, it was a perfectly good depth, we ended up saying they should go somewhat deeper. It took a year to do one ray tracing uh, and the computer I assembled consisted of six young women, because it was young women because they answered the ad, in a room with electrified Marchant and Frieden calculators and a spreadsheet and everything in little blocks and Snell's Law at the boundary of the blocks and you know after a while you actually saw a ray. It was fascinating. Okay, so how does, what was this ONR system? Well first place it started with uh, Roger Bacon, 1620, not explicitly, but implicitly. <laughs> Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. That is, you've got to find out how things work if you want to build machines that work. And the scheme was, you know, we have Navy questions which we'll discuss with you. You figure out what to do about it. The program officers were mostly civilians. Some of them were regular civil servants, usually out of the laboratories, particularly NRL. But a lot of them were people who were recruited from universities and labs to come in for a couple of years and go out. So you were tended to be dealing with people who were colleagues. The naval officers who were assigned there were experienced and educated. They generally had degrees in physics or advanced degrees, so it was easy. And, you know, coming out of World War II, everybody around this place was comfortable with the Navy. They'd been working with the Navy for six or seven years. And a lot of them, Fred Spies was an ex-submarine officer, so lots of the people were just comfortable. It was an easy social situation. So the way they, that ONR went about doing things was, I think of it as the investigators club. You know, the guys in ONR and people in the fleet in the Navy and people in the university labs and in the Navy labs and in the contractor laboratories. 
was kind of, you know, we're all in this together trying to figure out how to solve the Navy's problems. Not very much, uh, you know, we're inside, you're outside, we're the customer, you're the supplier, but much more, hey, we got this problem. Uh, this is a technical term I learned at, at, uh, at the Kennedy School. An epistemic community is a community of people involved in the same body of knowledge. Oceanographers are an epistemic community, and inside that, uh, 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 marine geologists are a, a, a smaller epistemic community, and so on. And there was a lot of what is, anthropologists would call mutual acculturation, namely those who didn't know about the Navy kind of got indoctrinated into it, and naval officers kind of got indoctrinated into the odd ways that scientists and engineers behaved. And there were no artificial lines drawn so that you'd have the same room, the same ship, naval officers, university people, Navy labs, industrial contractors, anybody who was assembled because they probably actually knew something or could do something that, that could do the job. In fact, I was involved in at least one formal, formally chartered Navy com uh, committee which had all those kinds of people on it, officially, all together, quite illegal now. Nobody would allow that. I mean, they're different kinds of contractors and their civil service and so on, but it actually worked. Everybody knew who everybody else was. So if somebody said, well, you ought to use such and such a system, and you knew he was from company X that made that system, you know, you got in the appropriate conversation. It was not a difficulty. But so the way of doing the program offices played a funny role, and I think they probably still do at ONR, of being communication nodes. That is, they talk to a whole string of people who are out doing research, and you know, the ideas would come together, and so you'd get a phone call that said, I was talking to so-and-so at the University of Iowa about a mathematical something, and it reminded me of a question you asked me about such and such, here's his phone number, here's her phone number, call him up, so that that was very useful, and furthermore, they acted as a recruiting system to find new people to get into this investigators club. Then there was a lot of advisory oversight. Uh, Hudson Labs, when I did this ray tracing, I talked about the Navy wasn't quite sure they wanted this newly minted PhD theoretical physicist producing numbers that they were actually gonna act on. So they gave me an advisory committee of three people. The three people were Harvey Brooks, who was the Dean of Applied, Science, Applied Physics and Engineering at Harvard. Uh, a guy named Brackett Hersey, who was a, a senior, senior guy here. And a third guy named Warren Tyrrell, who was from Bell Labs and, and inside the SOSIS business. Uh, they'd put together ad hoc committees all the times. Sometimes people would go to each other's labs just to go and see what was happening. All of this is familiar. There is, a, there is by law a thing called the Naval Research Advisory Committee, which sometimes plays a useful function and sometimes just a ceremonial function. It depends on who's on it and whether anybody, whether the secretary wants to listen. And then there was an undersea warfare committee that later became the Naval Studies Board, and some of this machinery is, is still there. So just my, uh, my own experiences, this I mentioned. The second question was, all of the sonar and underwater acoustics people who had come out of World War II had worked with sonars that were up in the multi-kilohertz region where there wasn't any coherence. I mean, if there was a 10, if there was a 10 wavelength coherence, you never found out about it. And so they were telling us, you know, this ocean is chaotic, it's turbulent, you guys are never going to see anything useful at long range, you're not going to be able to make very long arrays, and so on. So that was our first question, and we looked out at the ocean and said, what is it in the ocean that can possibly be changing fast enough, spatially and temporally, to affect a hundred hertz sound wave? We call them cycles per second in those days. Hertz hadn't been the name yet. 
And the answer was we couldn't think of anything. Everything we could think of was slowly changing uh, compared to that or was big and was going to be averaged over. So we did an experiment. We borrowed four hydrophones. Well, we did two experiments. Let me tell you the first. We had a guy named Dana Mitchell, who was a professor of physics at Columbia, who thought about making a very, very loud, low-frequency sound source. And he took a device that would call, was called an A Mark 6B minesweep. The A Mark 6B had a steel case which was about two inches thick. And in it, there was a 10 horsepower DC motor and a crankshaft. And at the edges, at both sides, there was a steel plate this big with a thick rubber gasket. And so when the motor went around, these plates went in and out. It was a monopole source. And let me tell you, if you stood, stood two feet away from it in air, it pumped your chest. This was, but it was, it wobbled, it wobbled, it was a DC motor. So he extended the case and the shaft and put a one horsepower AC motor on it, which we ran from a tuning fork running a big thyrotron oscillator, and we got a Q of 8,000. That is, we could really, really control this thing when you locked it into the tuning fork. So the first thing we did was put it on a ship and send the ship out 600, 800 miles to sea and listen on a hydrophone. And of course we could, one of the early Hewlett Packard audio oscillators was used to, one of the ones that came out of the garage, I think, was used to beat this. And of course we could get the Doppler shift. So we knew the, the radial velocity. And we actually called the ship up one day and said, the kid who was on the wheel yesterday at 2 p.m. is on the wheel again, isn't he? <laughs> he's, he's, he's the one who writes his name on the water. <laughs> and it was really, the, we were able to have him make boxes and, you know, in travel time later we knew it was going. So we were pretty sure it was fairly coherent. But we then uh, decided to make a big array. So we borrowed a Sosis hydrophone from Eleuthera, uh, Cape Hatteras, Cape May and Sable Island and got the AT&T Long Lines Department, they've never done anything like this, to give us a connecting circuit, a dedicated circuit from Eleuthera, from those four places into Hudson Labs. And we, we ran the array. I mean, it was strictly speaking unnecessary, but it was perfectly clear that we had a coherent four element array that was sort of as big as the ocean. So that that work. And then we worked on the other questions that everybody's still working on, you know, <laughs> except it's probably changed now. One of our questions was how much is ship noise? And I think the answer is now a lot, but not quite so much then. Okay, then, then here are, here are, you know, this, this were all the things. Then the Navy came one, in one day and said, okay, you guys know so much, build us a hundred mile sonar. And we eventually translated to that saying, can we build a third convergence zone sonar? And we wanted a name for the project. We wanted to call it Project Diana because she was the goddess of the hunt after Ted Hunt who had started the Ocean and Hour thing. But the Air Force was using that, so we made it Artemis, the Roman goddess of the hunt, same as Diana, but Latin name. And uh, we started to build this thing. Uh, in the end, we had to take a 10,000 ton tanker, cut a sea chest through it, and de dedicate it to hang the sound source. The junction box on a reef off Bermuda was on an early Texas tower because we had uh, 200 hydrophone towers, each with uh, uh, 20 hydrophones on it, erected on the bottom. And in the end, after I had left, they actually did get third convergence zone echoes. But then you turned around and said, yeah, I can do it. 
Now what do I do with a system that scale? Because there wasn't a hell of a lot of excess signal-to-noise ratio in it. We also, by the way, had a terrible time uh, figuring out how to do the signal processing. No computers, delay lines maybe, and Ross Williams did some neat stuff with optical processing, but that was optical processing <coughs> in which you did Fourier transforms by optical processing with actual signal on film. So it was a tricky business. Then the other interesting aspect of ONR, this was the other advantage at the time was there was a lot of money around. Cold War times. But you'd get a suddenly get a call, can you come to Washington Thursday? We got this funny problem I can't tell you about on the telephone, and some of the guys are getting together and there'd be this same heterogeneous group of people trying to figure out what, what the latest funny signal from a Soviet submarine meant or what it, was all, what it was all about. And sometimes it was really nice. We're coming to the end of the fiscal year and we got this $10 million we, we got to get rid of, so let's have a little conference on what's the really important thing to do with the marginal $10 million. And so we figure out what to do with it. Students say to me, how do I have a great career like yours? And the answer is, you have to be born into an expanding universe. <laughs> <laughs> See, the current students have been born into a contracting universe. Very difficult. OK, now there was a lot of other stuff we, we went to see. In, uh, Navy gave us a ship. They gave us an ATA, an attack tug, 600, 600, uh, uh, 600 tons. And there was a guy who I was privately, must have been the model for, for, for Quig. He threw me off the bridge because I suggested that maybe we weren't in the Puerto Rico Trench because the depth was only about 1,000 fathoms. <laughs> uh, his next job, by the way, was, was a disciplinary officer at Portsmouth Naval Prison. <laughs> <laughs> and we, had, we did a thing called Medea. And, 55, it was another typical mix and match operation. We had a Navy, uh, we had a Coast Guard cable layer, we had the Hudson Lab ship, the Willard Gibbs, which was a converted AVP, aviation personnel ship from World War II. We had two EPC ERs that belonged to Navy labs, and something else. Oh, yes, a destroyer escort. The destroyer escort was used for throwing explosives over the side, mostly. And that was our fleet, and it was manned by scientists from any place you could think of. We had a mix of people from all sorts of places, from here and, and so on. And we went and surveyed the Norwegian Sea for Sosis. The question was, could you, was the acoustic such that you could put a Sosis array in the Norwegian Sea? And the answer was yes, and I don't know whether there ever was one or not. Uh, it was kind of a fun trip. We got into a storm northwest of Iceland in which the hydrographic office professional wave uh, uh, observer on board said, we are now in 50 to 60 foot seas with the top 10 to 20 feet breaking. Short, <coughs> short crested sea. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. Then I mentioned the Undersea Warfare R&D Planning Council and it's worth noting this was the same mix of people. The thresher went down the night of our annual meeting in DC, the night we had the dinner with all the senior naval officers. I was happened to be chairman at the time. And so here we are with a room full of senior admirals, more, more gold braid and white uniforms that I can remember seeing. And half the Navy scientific civil service from D.C. and so on. And suddenly the, the guys with the loafers loops, the aides, start popping in and out and whispering to admirals and popping in and out. And finally the senior admiral tells us what happened, uh, threshers down and so on. And the Navy at that point said, you know, we don't have anything much to look for her with. We've got nothing, you know, we've got ordinary sonars and so on. So the committee organized the search for the thresher on the spot. And we didn't have anything to look for the thresher either. But everybody thought they had something that might be useful. 
So at one point, there were five ships out there towing anything anybody thought was useful. Magnetometers, cameras from here that went down and took film and came up, uh, sonars, whatever anybody had. Uh, the, by the way, nobody had communication for such a fleet, voice communication. I had the only, Hudson for some reason had the only single sideband radios and the only single sideband station. So we ran around to every electronic store in, in New York City buying single sideband transceivers for all the other ships, put them on and hung the, hung the thing together. The Navy eventually, uh, about a week after we were all at sea searching, they, they, they conjured up a, a poor devil to be the operations officer in charge of this search, and he didn't know anything about it, so he just kind of had a trail around. Uh, she was actually found with a magnetometer strike from somebody here, and that gave us a datum where we got pictures of stuff, and then we were able to follow it up, but it was kind of, kind of an interesting adventure. Now, ARPA. <coughs> ARPA was the same kind of operation except smaller, intended to, have, to sponsor very advanced stuff, never go into production. You know, if you actually proved the science and the rudimentary engineering, you'd try to pass it off to one of the services to, to do the next thing. We had, I went there to do the nuclear test detection uh, job after the limited test ban treaty. And the, 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 uh, the bureaucratic ideas of ARPA were, are well exemplified this. The procurement officer said, if one of you guys comes in before noon and said, I had an interesting phone call from so-and-so, uh, and I think we should do something about it, we'll have an authorization to that person to spend money by the end of the day. Not for everything, but if, you know, a few, a few a week we can do that a different time and spirit. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know whether they do that anymore. And then, of course, I could go through a lot of, a lot of stuff here, but it's more, more bureaucratics. But I'll tell two stories. One, one is that the way we found out, other than that she was overdue, that the Scorpion was lost in the middle of the Atlantic, was that Gordon Hamilton, who was then, uh, was then sort of a one-man ONR contractor in Bermuda at the Bermuda Biological Lab, running some hydrophones there, saw something funny as an acoustic signal on one of his hydrophones and said, I think that's something, something imploding. And then they conducted a search on all the SOSIS records and were able to find the details and follow it. So you know about that. Alvin, you guys, and Palomaris, you guys know all about. This is an interesting one about applied physics, uh, applied science of any, any kind, and whether people understand what's applicable and what isn't. I got a call from, uh, who was it? Tom Owen was then the chief of naval research. And Tom said, boss, I got a funny problem. As the guy who ran the R&D budget, and by agreement and law, the chief of naval research reported to me and double-hatted to the CNO. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, there's an ad that's just appeared in one of the mathematical journals. Remember, this is sort of 68, 69, Vietnam War time. Uh, signed by three eminent mathematicians saying, mathematicians do not take the, the dirty money, roughly the dirty money from the Department of Defense and thereby support the effort for this terrible war. And I said, well, you know, mathematicians are entitled to do that. What's the problem? He said, they're all contractors of ONR. <laughs> and two of them are contractors of the Army and the Air Force. What should I do? I said, well, the first thing you do, Tom, is don't do anything. Let's think about it. And in those days, we had, I was, I was host, because we had the best dining room, to, the, uh, to a weekly meeting of the assistant secretaries of the services for R&D and the military chiefs of R&D for the service, chief of naval research, army and air force equivalent, uh, 
uh, sometimes the director of the CIA, sometimes the president's science advisor, and the D director of defense research and engineering. It was just a general conversation, what's going on. So we raised this, we raised this question. You know, what should we do? And finally, after much discussion, somebody, maybe me, proposed, we're going to write these guys a letter. And it's going to be a very simple letter that just says, we have noted your uh, ad in such and such a journal. And as we're no now doing our preliminary budget planning for next year, we'd like to know whether we should pencil you in at about the usual amount. <laughs> well, we got, I don't know, three telegrams and a letter and so on. And one of them said, well, of course, because my pure mathematics, uh, I know that it cannot really be used for any military purpose, it's <laughs> thus and so. But nobody felt we wanted to tell him that, in fact, his papers were being used to develop algorithms for figuring out ordnance loading on bombers. <laughs> so uh, just an example of, do you actually have to know what your stuff is used for? Not really. Uh, and then, you know, finally, the, the main point of the thing is the reason all of this worked is because you had people from different backgrounds and fields and subjects uh, working together. And the ingredients for that are, you know, You've got to have enough mutual respect so you can really sit down and talk about what a problem means. Uh, you can't do it uh, the way the procurement people like to have it done uh, at arm's length. That's a, that is a perfect recipe for failure, and we see it all the time. I mean, we're seeing it in, clearly in the big dig in some ways. Uh, con conversation has to lead to that. You've got to really agree on what it is you're trying to do. And uh, you have to have some kind of a sense of working community. And then, of course, money. But it may not be a lot of money. You know, I had for a long time, I had a kind of a working hypothesis, which was never give a scientist money for the first thing they come in and ask for. If the third thing turns out to be the same th as the first one, that's OK, but not the first one. Make them go back and think about it. Otherwise, you'll be, you know. Uh, and you've got to have enough bureaucratic support so you can run the place, but you don't want it to put a blanket over you. I think external advisory and oversight systems are good. And always you have to listen. But as I've said, you have to be careful to think about what you're hearing, because it maybe shouldn't be taken on, on faith. And that's it. Okay. Oh. Question, comment, Bill? Yeah, in the Artemis, can you relate the sea spider array to the Artemis project? It was much later and not related. Okay. It was after, uh, that was something that Brackett was trying to do. Well, it was related in the sense that it was an attempt to answer the question, could we do the engineering that would enable us to make a reasonably big three-dimensional array in the deep ocean. And that was certainly one problem that had to be solved if you were going to, you know, in principle, one could think of doing a, an Artemis in a region if you could build a big three-dimensional array, and then you could always drive the sound source around on a ship. But if you thought about the system isn't portable, it's certainly not mobile, it isn't very portable. How many of these things are you going to do? How many ships are you going to run around? The general conclusion was that was not a good way to solve the problem. And the other half, of course, was that this was all in the era when, submarine, when Soviet submarines were very, very loud. You know, the Soviet Polaris boats were called, the, the, the term of art in the US Navy was boomers. And the funny part was that, you know, there were lots of people going around saying, well, the Soviets, Sovietskis don't actually know anything about the acoustics. And I'd say, well, there's this guy Brechovsky who <laughs> publishes on it. Would you like to see his articles? He seems to know roughly what we know. So I don't know what's, I, I, I never have found out or found anybody who could tell me 
how come the Soviets decided they didn't care that their submarines were noisy? I just don't know. Uh, my impression would be that there may well, in spite of the fact that Brachovsky and others were both on the civilian and the military side, that somehow or other the higher parts of the Navy didn't really want to pay any attention to that. For a while I had a theory that the Soviet boats were really very, very quiet, but that all the, all the vibration isolators had wooden blocks in them with a sledgehammer ha ne hanging next to them. So if a signal was given, you knock out all the blocks and everything goes down 20 dB. But as far as I know, that wasn't right. <laughs> so I think there's a, there's a sort of a connection. But the problem was that uh, I think the, 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 the mooring and buoy engineering that Brackett was trying to work with at the time wasn't quite up to it. Or at least they didn't work. They, they, they had mechanical problems, really, was the, the difficulty. You Ken? mentioned Navy worries after the Second World War, and uh, yeah. their view that it was a close call. But uh, there's another literature connected with operations research, yeah. which is really quite optimistic on the subject of anti submarine warfare. And I just wonder what your take is on that. Well, as it happens, I am now, even now, in a running battle with trying to get the attention of somebody in the Navy over the analytical methods they're using for warfare analysis. They're using a system of methods called stand, they call standard practice, but which fundamentally makes very simple analytical assumptions, essentially what they do is they do one weapon, one target uh, analysis, and then they just uh, do the probability of a large number of independent events. And that's clearly too simple. And there is another body of stuff called configural theory, which is associated with one particular guy who was a contractor for a long time, that does it more correctly. I mean, I have a couple of of neat, simple, probabilistic examples that show that. And, and there are some very interesting statistical arguments. Uh, for example, the standard practice people assume that the law of large numbers always applies, so that you can take averages uh, of averages. And even that isn't right, because in nonlinear systems, the average of a function of a of, of another function is not the same as the function of the average. So they make that error, uh, but also they, they don't really, they assume this law of large numbers thing, and it doesn't actually apply if you, if you make realistic assumptions about things like minefields and so on. It's not very complicated. I've, I've after some trouble with my colleague, I, I worked out a, a five-page example that someone else had suggested the principle of that doesn't even require probability theory. It just requires making the table of possibilities. And you can immediately see that, that the, the distribution does not converge to a mean. I mean, it, it, the, the, more, the, more, the farther you go into the system, the more, the more it tends to flatten out. So there is a, there is a large issue there. Uh, the standard operation, I've, I've been looking at this, and recently I went and said, well, maybe I better find out what the operations research people are up to. So I looked at a couple of textbooks, and they're pure applied mathematics. They don't have anything in them about how to set up a model. So I don't know what's going on exactly, but I think it is still an, still an issue. Uh, I had a place on a slide which was a placeholder to talk about the system, McNamara systems analysts of which the less said the better, but uh, uh, crude analysis tends to produce bad results is, is, is the only thing to say. You know, it takes, the sophistication is not in doing the mathematics. The sophistication is in thinking up what it is worth doing the mathematics about. You know, and my prime example is Einstein, who always said he was not much of a mathematician, which is correct. But he had the ideas that were worth doing the mathematics about, and he went and took a walk with Levi Chavita, who said, oh, yes, there is a mathematics for that. It's called tensor analysis. Let me show you. <laughs> so I think that's a 
that's a key point. But I, don't, I, don't, I, I know there are all sorts of analyses that, that say, you know, this is no problem. But in fact, if you look at what's really going on, I think you find out it is a problem. More? Less? Okay. Thank you. Next week. Next week.